Right, we're back again with Dominic Granger, pretending there's a fire going there. Uh, and I'm not going to call the break after this one, all right? That was a sorry mistake. No I apologise for that. So, welcome, Dominic Granger, Chief Executive of uh, EMEA for Group M. So you started your career at Pricewaterhouse and then by chance, a good one I assume, uh, one of your clients was the Media Independent CIA. And for those of us with a history of Adland, that has morphed into gradual iterations into what is Wavemaker today. And you started there as CFO uh, for Europe and then after, a, which I remember, an epic and thoroughly bad temple, bad tempered takeover battle uh, it became part of the WPP empire, and you stayed, and you're now CEO of Amir for Group M. Um, page one of the Group M uh, website says that you buy one in three ads globally, according to RECMA. That gives you a lot of power. Does it give you responsibility as well? Yeah, well, uh, you know, power, I'm not sure. You know, we're, we're, I suppose, empowered by the relationships we have with our clients because we're acting, you know, on behalf of them. And it's their money that we are... You have thrown your weight around from time to time. Well, look, but, but that, <laughs> maybe that's what comes with, uh, with the relationship is you want to, you know, exercise your judgment on behalf of your clients to hold some of our partners to account yeah. when necessary and to... Uh, yeah, sometimes it's as, as simple as trying to negotiate the best deals, but other times it's trying to make sure that, I guess, uh, we're getting what's in the best interests of our clients, yeah. which are the advertisers. So, yeah. But a responsibility in the wider sense of the word? I think we all have a responsibility in the wider sense of the word, and a lot of the issues that have come up already this morning, and I'm sure we'll touch on, you know, we all together have a responsibility, I think, to act in the right way and to... Yeah, to try and not only act in the interests of our own clients and stakeholders, but the wider consumers. Okay, let's let's start to sort of unpick some of that stuff. I mean, if you if you listen to some of the earlier sessions and you group together all the kind of stuff that's bubbling around um, in the industry at the moment, all that negativity, um, you would assume that we're in the midst of a full blown. Uh, media effectiveness and, and brand health crisis, uh, as well as other ones as well. And brands, media agencies, everybody's grappling with their own problems. Um, and you all need each other, but the kind of solutions have no con consequences for each other if you try and sort of... So, so are we... Is this just a cyclical moment or is it a kind of permanent uh, uh, or more of a structural thing that, you know, that we've got to tackle? Uh, how cyclical, how... Structure. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's kind of a big question. Quite yeah, a few well, issues, you know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, look, look. I mean, our business uh, on one level is cyclical, as as I think Carolyn said earlier, in terms of some advertising trends and things like that. But I think there's been a lot of change, um, not only in consumers' behaviour, but that's driven ultimately a different sort of media owner tech platform landscape. So I'd call that kind of structural change at yeah. the end of the day. And I think it does mean all of our businesses have changed at the same time even if perhaps we all came, many of us who existed, you know, our companies existed a while ago from the analog world, we're trying to adapt at the same time. So I think there's been structural change everywhere, which is beyond cyclical. There are still cyclical dynamics in what's going on, of course. Okay, and, and, and you know, media agency, in a sense, you sit at the sharp end because you're the interface between the media owners on one hand and the brands on the other. Yeah. So what are, the th what are the things that give you sleepless nights at the moment? <laughs> Well, such a thing as possible. Yeah, I mean, look, yeah, and by the way, earlier you talked about a lot of negativity. I mean, I think it's not just negativity. There are, there are challenges for a lot of people, but there's massive opportunity. And I think it is actually the most exciting time you could really imagine if you can stand back from it. But I mean, yeah, of course, some of these challenges create sort of, I guess, sleepless nights. I mean, I think, look, the wider area of just technology, which covers a lot of things, and the way technology has advanced in recent years, whether that's from the basic point of view of how consumers can behave now and, and what that does for all of our lives daily and therefore how they interact with brands, with media, etc., through to the fact that tech platforms have grown up very fast into very, very big uh, companies. And, you know, that's been touched on already this morning. I mean, in some areas, that means you've got very few players with a lot of power. Yeah. Um, with a, with a lot of influence, um, and, and I don't just mean sort of media power, but I mean all sorts of power in terms of consumers and everything. 
Um, and I think that we, in general, believe that a, a more balanced marketplace is better for ultimately for our clients. So trying to give people choice is obviously better in general. And technology at the same time, um, you know, creates a lot of challenges in our business because we need to advance fast. I guess many uh, agencies like ourselves did not start out as tech companies at all. We're not tech companies yeah. and we've had to learn a lot about tech and, and use that. At the same time, though, what gives the sleepless night, I guess, gives the opportunity as well because tech is the massive opportunity. I think already we're seeing, you know, we need to do more, but we're probably operating, we're definitely operating in, in more efficiently than ever for our clients and passing that on to our clients. We're using tech in more and more advanced ways, whether it's through to AI, where we've launched new, new products. Yeah. But I mean, just, just sticking with that tech thing, is, is, is the tech issue at the heart of the media effectiveness and, and brand health crisis that you know, Mike and Jill talked about and other people have talked about as well, in the sense that it encourages because it's easier to do this kind of short-term measurement for very obvious reasons it's much easier to do and discourages that kind of longer-term thinking and longer-term behavior so is tech both the, the root of that problem and then possibly the solution further down the line yeah i mean maybe it's more complicated i don't think it's as binary as that obviously i, I always think look at tech things has... in a binary way it's so much easier <laughs> I, I, I think tech has created yeah. uh, just a lot more players more ecosystems. Maybe there was a simpler ecosystem yeah. before. I mean, even in TV, you know, there were many less, you know, choices than, yeah. than there are now, let alone into addressable TV world. So I think, and the fact we've got these different ecosystems, it's kind of, you know, measurement's a key issue when you get into some of yeah. these points. And it's hard to measure across those different ecosystems. So I guess the holy grail is, is being able to have granular measurement across all of those and ultimately then make your choices and, and be able to attribute value yeah. in the right way. In the right way, yeah. and, and I think we're not quite at that stage yet. You know, so we're in the process of getting from A to B and, that's, you know, and things are moving fast around us and people have to make choices. And coming back to short-termism, I, I don't know. I think um, it depends where you look because there are many different advertisers operating in the marketplace and they all have different pressures on them and have to look at their own specific objectives for yeah. their business. And of course, you know, many big businesses are under short-term cost pressure, so I guess they want more bang for their buck. That doesn't necessarily mean they have a short-term approach to their communications. Yeah. That may depend. What sort of, I mean, you know, you, you, you obviously see, uh, uh, if you look after EMEA, you know, a broad spectrum of of uh, brands and different media owners as well, I suppose. I mean, do you have these difficult short-term, long-term conversations with the brands that you work with? Yeah, look, I think those are on, those are those were always issues, and I don't think they're any different now. Short-term, long-term, you know, for any brand-driven business, was a discussion yeah. in the past. As I say, I think there are probably more pressures on certain businesses these days than ever. Yeah, and you could say that might push some of those into you know, cost-saving initiatives or whatever, zero-based budgeting, all these things have become, you know, uh, terms that yeah. we hadn't heard of 10 years ago have become very, very common. Um, but again, it's a question of how you manage your communications within all those pressures on you. So I think, of course, around Europe, the fascinating thing about my job is that although there are so many similar, you know, we're, we're doing the same things for our clients in all those markets, there are different factors at play, there are different media landscapes to some extent. Um, even the TV landscape is very different in some countries and advancing at, yeah. at different stages. Uh, you know, our clients, we still have similar categories of clients, I guess, but uh, you'll, see, you'll see different dynamics in a more emerging market like a, a Turkey or a Russia than you will in more established markets. Yeah. I'm going to quote you something from the Group M State of Video report, because um, I think it's relevant, but just get your take on it here. Um, it says, we're stuck between the traditional and the modern. Um, we have a choice, uh, force fit digital video into linear mechanisms, mechanisms and pricing, or B, modernize for targeting, automation and optimizing. Um, are we moving in the modernizing direction fast enough, or is it just, you know, to me it seems one step forward, one step back, one step sideways. Yeah, I don't think it's as, quite as bad as that. But I think, look, we can never move fast enough. I think we need to move faster. And I think all these channels have grown up very fast. And, you know, for a lot of time, people were, you know, adapting TV creative to digital, you know, and, and stuff like that. And, and many people still are. And, of course, it doesn't work as well. So I think that, 
we need to move faster. I think you'll find that a lot of uh, both advertisers who've looked at their content models and how they develop content and definitely agencies uh, have been moving, I think, pretty fast in that direction. Yeah. But, you know, we in our group are trying to bring things together more to make sure we've got um, agencies that are ready to deliver those sort of solutions quicker. Yeah. So I think we do, and I think we need to experiment more. And I think even talking about just in TV, experimenting with different formats and ad lengths and stuff yeah. like that is, is going to help. Yeah. How much, and how are clients open to this kind of experimentation? Because, you know, if they're already feeling the heat... It's, they've got to be quite brave to be willing to experiment. Well, you don't have to bet the farm on experimenting. So I think part of it, I mean, we heard of the AA example earlier, it's back to the short-term, long-term. You're under pressure from all sides to deliver short-term sales, but you want to build a long-term brand. And, and at the same time, you need to experiment with new models at the moment. So I think it's, you know, some clients, I guess, have more that mentality than others. Yeah. And you could say that certainly many new entrants coming into our space experiment a lot. That's so, in their yeah, DNA. I mean, and I think that's the challenge for existing companies is to, is to, to change the psyche. But as the same for agencies. You have to be prepared to experiment. Can, I mean, can established brands learn anything about their media mix and the experimentation from the direct-to-consumer brands that are coming in? They're you know, hugely disruptive, but many of them are doing... They have an interesting balance to strike. They've got to, you know get off to a, a, a very quick start in order to survive, but then they've got to build a brand as well. So it's quite an interesting yeah. tension there. Yeah, and I think we've seen some um, big FMCG companies buying into direct-to-consumer businesses as much as anything, not just to buy that business and acquire that business, but to learn more around that direct-to-consumer marketing and, and how to leverage that and, I guess, yeah. ultimately get the best of both worlds and try and build more direct relationships with consumers, perhaps for all their brands across their business. So, yeah, I think absolutely. Yeah. I mean, we, media agencies have, you know, have been in the spotlight for a lot of reasons um, in the last few years. Um, uh, you know, we've got the trend to in-housing, um, and we've got that Enders analysis report about short-termism. Um, what is... Well, let's just talk about the in-housing one, first of all, because how powerful a force do you think that is, and, and is it ultimately something that you can really push back on? It's not a question of pushing back on it. I mean, I think the in-housing, you know, even the agency model and then moving to elements of media, in our case, being handled in-house. I mean, this has been a debate for a long time. And it's not long ago that actually we took on a client's in-house agency and they wanted to outsource it to us and we handled that and it was going in, and that's just a few that years ago. That sort of stuff never gets into the public eye, does it? Well, not as, I mean, some, some of it does, some of it doesn't, but, but I think that, that was a few years ago. I think now, obviously, as we said, with the way tech and data in particular has, has tech has developed and the opportunities around data, you know, you need to be organised in a different way, whether you're an agency or, or an advertiser. So I think people, again, are looking at, well, if, if I'm a an advertiser that already has a lot of data within my organization, how do I best organize myself to, uh, to manage, say, my media communications? And that may be in-housing some of it. And I think that, you know, we at the moment have been built, we have many clients that work in different ways. So threat or opportunity, I mean, we have to deal with it. Because, it? because no, because by the way, it's in our, <coughs> we, we need what's best for our clients. So in some cases, in-housing, some people, I mean, in-housing as well, that's a broad term. You know, we tend to use the word in-sourcing in some mm. cases. So we've got agency people sitting in with our right, clients. Yeah. So we've got, in particular, M6, one of our agencies, uh, works a lot with CHI, in-source teams into client premises. Yeah. So they're, and they are a mixture of media, creative, and data people working very, very closely together. And they might spend most of their time on the client premises. And we see that as a very flexible, interesting model. It's getting a lot of traction. We have other clients who just w might want to insource part of the operation. So in-housing is not just a stick to beat you up over price on? Oh, I mean, look, I, I, I don't see it as that at all. Okay. I, think, I think the debates, you know most of our clients you know, aren't going to just use that as a stick. I think it's more a discussion about what is going to give the best results for our clients. Yeah. Two of the things that Group M has invested heavily in the past, in, in recent past, are, are products like M Platform and Finecast. Mm -hmm. um, just, I mean, maybe you could just 
quickly explain their relevance in case people don't know, but does, does that tell you that tech and media combined is the kind of sweet spot? Well, look, I mean, I think tech and media are interconnected completely now. And yeah, probably our biggest area of investment over the last few years has been M-Platform, which is our, our sort of audience uh, intelligence and activation platform, effectively our sort of DMP across Group M, and that can power you know, one-to-one -one consumer engagement. That, how we help our clients sort of access and manage their data and really find the sweet spot of communications is going to be enabled by technology is and by data. Is that first-party and a third-party data combination? It could be, yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, and, yeah. and so, and if you think about it, so we have certain data access to certain data, not just via Group M, it could be via Kantar, could be via other parts of the group. And then our client, we'll have different models, again, for how we'll work with our clients. But I think understanding that data, data better to, to ultimately drive better sales for our clients is, is where it's at. And you have to use tech. The question is, I think, being flexible. I think we're constantly evolving our models and we're, you know, we need to really be able to work with so many different platforms, with so many different um, marketing uh, tech stacks with di that different clients have. So I think, I think we'll be even more open source in the future in terms of how we work with clients. We'll have to be. And fine cost. Mm -hmm. So Finecast is our, for those that don't know it, it's our addressable TV business. Been going uh, about, which is, about 15 months? Which has been going, yeah, a little while now, just over yeah. a year. Um, well over 100 clients now. And it, and it offers our clients access to addressable TV solutions across all the, all the TV companies, all the platforms that are available at the moment. So I think it's unique of its kind in the UK at the moment. We're seeing a lot of traction there. We're seeing very, very high completion rates and nearly all the clients spending on it, well over 90% come back and are spending right. more. So we, we see that as a very interesting opportunity. And can you tell us, do you know where, where's the money coming from for that addressable? Is it new money? Is it coming out of trade budgets, as some people have said in the past? Or is it, are they just substituting? Yeah, I mean, it's a mixture of things. I think, I think, um, in some cases where they are new players who are testing the model and maybe not existing TV customers, that, that might be new money. Yeah. That would be new money coming in out of, not obviously, uh, could, could be out of other digital or uh, budgets. I think what we're seeing in a lot of cases is that it is coming um, from many of our clients out of existing budgets. I mean, clearly with AdSmart, Sky are pushing it to be incremental budget, and in some cases that will be, but we're seeing clients uh, sometimes moving money out of, not just out of linear TV, could be out of VOD or, or, yeah. or direct. Yeah. So a mixture of areas, I think, and we'll see over time how that, how that evolves, but I think it genuinely is an opportunity for, for the TV sector. Okay. we we're, we're not got much time left. Um, if anybody, Dominic's very kindly said he'd take questions, a couple of questions from the audience. So is anybody up there? I can't see a thing from here. Now I can. Brilliant. One in the front there and one at the back there. Okay, we'll take those two and then we've got to just finish up. Just in, just in uh, general terms, do you think clients have that, or uh, referencing the AA case study that you saw this morning, do you think clients generally have the ratio between branding and performance activation correct these days? I just uh, it's, it's, it's very difficult for me to generalize and say that's right because I think clearly some people have probably got it more right than others and I think the objectives of our different clients are very different but people talk about um, you know I think a lot of money let's not forget kind of why this happened a lot of money moved with you know younger audiences have been under pressure on TV younger audiences spending more time online and I think some money's moved with that. You can question if that's always performance, you know, we talk about performance marketing. I'm not sure it's always performance as such. And uh, at, at the same time- What do you mean? T it's at, underperforming. At, at the, <laughs> no, but at the, at the same time though, TV overall revenues have been maintained and effectively unit costs are higher than they were. So I mean, maybe people are getting more bang out of their TV buck, they're putting money in, in online. They are in this spirit of sort of testing where the younger audiences are. And don't forget, you can, the counter as well to some of that money maybe being wasted in inverted commas is those younger audiences one day are going to be big spenders on those brands. So maybe you are investing partly, you know, a slight counter to that is that you partly are investing in the spenders of the future. Um, 
but I think overall, it's try trying to get that perfect balance is what I guess marketers always spent their lives trying to do, and now with even more choice. And perhaps, yeah, that pressure of where the audience is spending its time, there's more pressure on a budget at the end of the day. So is it perfect? I'm sure it's not perfect. I think it's, uh, I think TV at the same time has a lot of qualities that have been flagged this morning, and I think we look objectively across all media. TV has some clear strengths, and I think the fact that the big players are working more than ever together to, to really uh, promote that and demonstrate it as well, and there's plenty of evidence, is a good thing. And I, I genuinely think that addressable TV can really complement that, because there, and again, it might be a question of time, but you potentially can bring the advantages of online kind of marketing to a bigger screen environment, which could be really, really powerful if you think that you, know, that you could actually dive into content on your smart TV screen in the future. The stuff you yeah. could do as a, as a creative <coughs> agency or client with that in terms of really engaging people and drawing them into your, your products and brands is amazing. So I think we talk a lot about the sort of technical side of it and the targeting side of it, but actually the creative opportunities around addressable TV, yeah. I think are fantastic. Okay. One last question over there. John Reynolds, I'm a, a freelance journalist. Very quickly, uh, WPP boss, new boss, Mark Reeves, has obviously merged some of its creative agencies. Do you think it might merge some of it, more, more of its media agencies? Do you think WPP has got too many media agencies? And do you think there's a... Have you noticed a different culture under the new chief exec compared to the previous chief exec? <laughs> How many questions was yeah, that? Yeah, no. Uh, uh, Look, I mean... Uh, Just answer one. <laughs> it, it's, not, it's not for me to answer. Some of those questions are for, are for Mark to answer ultimately. I think Mark's been really focused on trying to get the group uh, better organised, organised in a more simple way that is ultimately better to deliver services to clients. So when, when we talk about some of these areas and making sure that we as a group can deliver optimal services... Uh, around not just, say, linear TV, but in the future, addressable TV, online solutions as well. I think having, uh, for example, now, uh, new agencies that have been formed out of maybe a more uh, a legacy creative agency and a more modern digital agency is going to create a stronger offer for clients. And I think that, that gives us very strong partners to work with within WBP, which is definitely a good thing. OK, and I think we are expecting his grand strategic vision or whatever it is if he hasn't actually done it all already um, sometime this month. Next week. Yeah. Next week. Yeah. Okay, right. There we go. Right, Dominic, I think we are out of time. I just want to say thank you very much. Will you join me in giving Dominic a big... Thank you. Thank you.